came to this work um, as Alan's research assistant to analyse some field tapes he'd made of sign language in the Highlands. And then as we were working together, it sort of became more and more clear that I really needed to you know, take this on as um, my master's thesis. And um, as Nick said, um, I really admire Alan jumping into this work despite having no background in sign. And for all of our, um, I was about to say collaboration, and that's really what it is. I've never felt like I'm his junior or even that I'm his assistant. He really does treat me like a colleague. Um, and uh, yeah, I've, I've been really impressed by his um, humility, even though he doesn't know anything about this area, and um, you know how quickly he's, um, he's learning and um, has given me such great advice throughout my master's thesis, which I've just recently finished, and um, some of this work is based on that. And indeed, Alan and Francesca and me all travelled together in 2018 to Western Highlands, to the Neville and Calville Valleys. So you can see them there on the map. The Highlands is a mountainous region in the middle of the country. There's Alan surveying the landscape over there. Um, you can get a sense there of how mountainous it is, how lush. Um, it's very intensively farmed. And there's not, um, there, it's heavily settled, but not in uh, very, very clu uh, densely clustered urban um, neighbourhoods. So the field work that we did in that time over a month in 2018, we, you can see there the community of Kyogre where Alan and Francesca have worked for many, many years. And um, Alan and I used a chain referral method to start with the two deaf people that he knew and to kind of um, use them as referrers and hearing people they were associated with with referrers to find more deaf people throughout the area to work with. So some generalisations that we uncovered. So all the communities in the area are really um, based on uh, tribal affiliation. There's most prototypically one deaf person per community and ergo per tribe. There's no deaf sociality in the area, so deaf sociality is um, deaf people desiring to draw close to other deaf people for special communication and friendship. Um, deaf people in this area don't see anything particularly special or interesting about being deaf or other deaf people. Their identity, like hearing people in the area, is, is really based more on um, tribe and clan identity. So the way that um, I've come up with through my thesis, and Alan's been um, so instrumental in um, you know, reaching out to social network analysis, helping me work through my reasoning, is to think about deaf signers in the region of each as the central node of their own particular sign network, which is a type of social network in the Milroy tradition, but it's one that's characterised by sign use. So sign networks, um, the, way I've come, uh, the way I describe them, they're made up of individual signers that are connected by a strong or weak sign ties. Now, obviously that's incredibly binary and everything's a lot more gradual and fluid than that, but that's a, that's a good you know, starting point. And why would we want to you know, think about this? Well, um, I like this quote from Victoria Mist, who's a sign linguist who works in West Africa. And this is very true, that there is a large grey area between deaf community sign languages, so big established sign languages like ASL, British Sign Language, Oz, British Sign Language and Auslan, and home sign, which are the ad hoc, one way, first generation uh, creations of typically linguistically isolated deaf children raised in a non sign environment. So that large grey area quote has remained virtually unstudied seemingly because we don't really know what to do with them. And I've found through a lot of my reading that home sign as a typological category, it just, anything that doesn't fit village or deaf community, it all just gets called home sign. And it's very imperfect. And there's a lot of really interesting subtle stuff in there if you want to uh, take some time to look at it. So this network analysis that Alan and I have been developing helps us to look more deeply at sign languages and to more broadly to consider how community structure conditions language shape. Um, I'll, I'll go through this quite quickly because I'm just quite conscious of the time. So as I said, home sign is, um, home sign are those ad hoc one way systems used by linguistically isolated deaf children. Based on our field work in the Highlands, we started to see cases that really didn't fit this mould. It really wasn't you know, a case of one way, a linguistically isolated person um, you know, who really struggles communicating with people. So we came up with this, we argued for this new social demographic typological category of a new creative network sign language. And I'll show you what that looks like. So this on the left is um, how I would draw the sign network of a classic case of home sign. The dotted lines denote weak sign ties. I should have said before, so a strong sign tie is one that is characterised by fluent and regular sign communication, and a weak sign tie is missing one of them. So it's either non-fluent or it's irregular. So that's prototypical home sign on the left. 
Kabul is the deaf man with whom we've worked extensively in Kyle and you'll see he's connected to a whole bunch of people via solid lines, which are strong sign ties, very, very fluid, regular sign communication, and um, dotted lines, which are um, weak sign ties. The, um, the red colour denotes a deaf person, and you'll see that um, he's not connected to um, any other deaf people by strong ties, and that's very characteristic of the Highlands. So, this is, the two, this is a conversation I'm going to go into great detail in today to look at how communication happens in the Highlands and talk a bit more about understanding and not understanding in this conversation and then we can extrapolate that out more widely. So in terms of the sign network analysis, obviously here on the left, that's, that's him, Simon, connected to the deaf node. The reason why there's no nodes connecting hearing signers is hearing people don't sign together unless in the presence of a deaf person or very rarely to prevent overhearing. It really is very much um, when they're talking with the deaf person in the area. So Opis is connected to Kagul the deaf man. That's why I've got him coming up from Kagul up there. On the right is Puss. Now Puss is deaf man. Um, I would draw his sign network as far as I can gather, given we, Alan and I could only work with him for one session. Like this, he signs a bit with his sister and a bit with other people. But he lives alone up in the mountains. He does, he's unmarried, doesn't have any children, doesn't have any pigs. He, like all people in the area, uh, works growing his own food. And he also, as will be relevant in the video, he works um, travelling around fixing people's thongs for pennies. And he's also got this incredibly elaborate torch that he's made himself out of discarded globes, wire and batteries. I think, Francesca, you were quite captivated by him and said he was like someone out of a, a special fairy tale, <laughs> like this little hobbit who lives in the mountains. Yeah. So, and the, so I've put the circle rail around Mount Hagen, which is um, the regional capital, and that's going to feature in this story. And people in this area travel regularly to Mount Hagen for, you know, various, um, various uh, things, as you'll see. Okay. Now, what we're going to see a bit of in this video, um, deaf people in this, and hearing people in this area of the Highlands, they don't just use sign language. They use a huge a plethora of multimodal strategies which are constantly changing depending on um, their interlocutor. So they use some signs, all of which are iconic, so they have a clear form to meaning relationship. Some of those signs are exclusive to those particular networks, and some of them, some of the signs are found in all the networks throughout the region that we've studied so far. They also make use of mainstream community gesture, like the county system that involves folding inward to the palm and then like a negative hand shape that hearing people use all the time. They use absolute or cardinal pointing, so being able to point with very good accuracy to real world locations. So if I was able to do it, I'd be able to point confidently to Sydney. But I've got no idea where Sydney is because I can't do this. They use speech, lip reading, vocalisation and mouthing in both the local indigenous language and top pisson, pantomime, deity pointing, pointing to itself, pointing to others. And, um, uh, manipulating objects in the environment, so you know, picking things up or going and getting things and using that as part of the, their communicative strategies. So let's watch this video um, where speech, where their spoken language, I've done it in sentence case, so upper lower case, and where their signs, I've done them in capitals, and I've left a lot of the gesture and pointing unglossed. Um, and then we're going to go through the two questions that Opis here poses to Puss and um, how he how they both negotiate understanding throughout this exchange. Okay. 
opposite. Alrighty. So in talking about understanding, not understanding, so how successful was communication in that exchange? So obvious, the guy on the left, he had two goals. To find out if Puss goes to Mount Hagen and to find out what Puss does there. And I believe that these goals <coughs> were eventually and mostly recognised by his audience, by Puss, because Puss responded with relevant information. Um, but both times, Opus appears to believe that he wasn't adequately understood on the first go of each question. So when he tried again, first of all, he uses a different set of semiotic resources that are in his toolkit. And then the second time he rephrases it, and he does so by recruiting knowledge of Puss and their shared common ground. So looking at the first one, the first uh, communicative goal, finding out does Puss go to Hagen. So the first time Opus but then he brings it up so then it's more pantomimic. Get another point to Hagen, and now Puss appears to get it. And Puss actually uses some speech. He points to Hagen and he says, town. And then they both decided that, yes, that, that goal's been achieved. Now, the next question, what do you get in Hagen? I apologise, the subtitle said, what do you do in Hagen? It was, what do you get? So I asked, why don't you kiss in Long Hagen? So what do you get in Hagen? Um, and Opus actually, he rephrases my question as what do you, what do you whatever with money in Hagen because he knows that the whole point of going to Hagen as a rural Navajo person is really to, to get stuff, buy and sell stuff. So an Opus does this by the absolute point to Hagen, the money sign, which I'm, it, it was always very hard for me to get the generic sign for money because when I would show the picture of all this cluster of bills and coins, people would always count it all up and then tell me exactly how much it was. <laughs> so I could never just work out what generic money was. Anyway, so he says money and then he does like a, a headward back toss gesture. And Puss seems to answer with something about, yeah, I pay to go on the bus and that's how I pay to go on the bus. And Opus doesn't seem happy with this. So he re Opus rephrases the question as a list of things Puss might buy. And he's using his knowledge here of Puss's occupation as a shoe fixer. So he assumes, okay, you're obviously going to buy shoe supplies like a rope, which is, um, yeah. And a puss is really special torch, so he assumes he's going to buy something to do with torture, so he says torch. And puss, as another Neville Valley man who, like Opus, usually if they go to Hagen, they'll buy, you know, rice is like the main thing people want to go and buy, so then that's the rice sign. And Opus seems like he's happy with puss's level of understanding. Puss reproduces rope and rice back to Opus really quickly. And puss, you may have, if you caught it, he says ice, ice. Puss does as he's signing rice. So he obviously got that one and he seemed quite satisfied. But it didn't all, it's not, it didn't all seem to get through. So when Opus does the torch sign, Puss appears to do, point to the torch and do thumbs up, like torch, yeah. And Opus <laughs> translates this back to me as Puss bought batteries. And I don't know if Opus thought that Puss was trying to do torch or if he was doing thumbs up. I also find it really interesting, the sign language in the network that Opus is part of, they have an established sign for battery like this. And Opus didn't choose to use that. Um, so I'm not sure why. He might have made a judgment that, I mean, it's not particularly iconic. So he might have just thought, okay, that's not going to work. I'll just say torch. Um, so although there's a lot of understanding here, we've still got a bit of a communication miss in that it's not really clear, clear if Puss buys the batteries Maybe he buys globes, other torch fixing things. So there was still, still not quite um, hitting the full understanding um, uh, goal. So to conclude, when I was writing this, I was thinking sign languages is a really easy term to use when talking about what Alan and I are working on, but they really might be better described as these fluid collections of multimodal resources that deaf and hearing people use. And um, the, I, I didn't mention earlier, the conventional, the, um, these sign, the languages associated with each of these networks have really small lexica. So sometimes I think they might only have like 20 established um, uh, signs. And the biggest one that Office is part of might have about 300. So because there's a really small lexicon, it means that senders and receivers need to do a lot of work and it's a lot of it's got to happen on the flight in order to make sure that your community goals are getting across. And this is just not something that happens in when we're speaking English or when you're using Auslan because we've got such a bigger 
lexicon, and that's to say nothing about the grammar. I can't say much about the grammar of these languages because that's something I'm yet to analyse. I like this quote from Friedman that making understanding happen is an agentive act. She was talking about deaf people in urban India, and it's very, very much true here. You've really got to work to understand and make understanding happen. And I find it interesting that neither time did Puss explicitly say, I don't know what you're talking about. Both times, Opus had to make a judgment on the fly that, OK, I don't, I don't think he's getting it, and now I'm going to rephrase. And then thinking about, you know, we don't have much of Puss's perspective in this, but he seems to have understood the sign rope and rise. I don't know if they're in his lexicon. Um, he may have just very quickly interpreted the, the basis of them on the fly. Um, so now going back to this thing about the batteries, this, even though that exchange was very successful in a lot of ways, there's still an element of not understanding. And in my experience working in, not only in the Highlands, but also work I've done in Port Moresby, communication in these young languages, there's a lot of not understanding that goes on. But what I find really interesting is that often when this happens, people don't seem to get that upset about it. So it's almost like that the, the practice of conversing and, and interacting with one another is more important than actually understanding every last thing that was said. And this has made me think of um, uh, Alan's work on Egg Ung, Fight Talk, has been talked about a lot today. But um, uh, in the local Kuwara spoken language, there's this understanding that some of the features of certain speech genres, they've got a, a, a bigger, you know, a higher level metapragmatic function. And that's more important than all the literal bits of what's inside them. So in some ways, these deaf conversations that are riddled with under, um, not understanding um, might be fulfilling a different metapragmatic function. And indeed, this really vividly illustrates language as a social and not strictly communicative act. So in these exchanges, we might only partly succeed in actually you know, changing one another's mental representations, but what we are succeeding in is having nice feelings and talking, even though it's kind of not, um, sometimes all, every single bit is not getting through. So now going back to successful communication, so if you want to have successful communication or understanding these languages, you've got to have really fast self-reflection, really good repair strategies, and being able to be very creative and very flexible with everything you've got in your multimodal toolkit to try and get to the goal. And not only that, you've also really got to think about your interlocutor, what, what they're going to get, and also what common ground you might share in order to structure your, um, in order to structure your utterance in order to get to your goal. And in some conversations of PNG, um, yeah, successful communications, really facilitated by a knowledge of, of your receiver's social life. And I put Alan there um, doing what he does best, you know, talking to people in his very gentle, very humble manner. He's a real listener. He's always been a real listener to me. And I think that's how he's been able to do such great scholarship is um, by, you know, having this um, uh, scholarship really imbued with humility, sitting back and listening, and then um, enabling both him and now myself to produce really good work. So thank you very much. That's what I mean. Right. I mean work, yeah. Did work come across a bit kind of negatively? And then when you highlight the last slide, it looks like this is something that an individual can do. So they're, they're reflecting on themselves and care and trying to be flexible. Whereas what I think there needs to be the less, but also the importance of how you interact with it. Right. Yeah. So you think that's fundamental? Say it again. It's hard for me to hear. You think it's really important to interact with part of it? Absolutely. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We will shortly be passing through some musical interludes.